All right. So I'm going to tell you today um, about two stages of work I've done on this. Um, uh, the first one was started when I was a postdoc at Harvard. Uh, and uh, David Abraham was the graduate student who was in charge of this work. After moving to Maryland in the mid to late 90s, uh, I looked into this problem again, the costulate salus transition, with a, another excellent graduate student, uh, Max Rapaci. Those of you who are superconductivity people recognize that there are some very uh, uh, important names, uh, uh, remarkable and pleasant people to work with. Uh, in addition to the students and postdocs who made all this possible. Now, it um, may not be practical, but I'd prefer to be informal. And if people have questions, I suppose you can try to save them, but you can also wave your hand around. I can see most of you, and uh, we can see if live questions work in addition. Um, also, um, I can't see you well enough uh, to recognize people, so if Art uh, wants to go and get another cup of coffee, for example, he should do that. Um, all right, so let me give a little bit of an outline. I want to tell you, first of all, what we understood about superconductors uh, before KT. Uh, it's a big uh, dividing line, and uh, both uh, for the field and for me. And uh, the big question that experimenters dealt with in the superconducting field was whether or not there actually was a costulate stylus transition. I'd like to make it clear that that was an important question. This wasn't just a matter of getting things set up. It never is. Uh, and confirming the theory. Uh, there were reasons to believe that it may not work at all. Uh, I'm going to talk about two ways to, that we actually did make it work. One uh, that Alan Goldman, who I believe is there, and Art Hebbard uh, uh, worked on. Another that we worked on at Harvard, and uh, there was work by other groups as well. Now, I'm going to take a little chance here. This is not going to be a highly technical talk. I'm not going to talk about scaling and all of those sorts of things. I'm going to give some pictures. And then what I'd like to do is uh, get to what I uh, believe is the key signature of the transition, observing the universal jump in the superfluid density at the costulate salus temperature. And uh, at first I'll do this with uh, an array of weak links or of Joseph's injunctions. And we actually did see the transition there, although it wasn't trivial. Uh, Next, uh, with the development of high temperature superconductors, I should say with their discovery, um, a lot of people were very tempted to see this beautiful physics in these layered materials, uh, in single crystals, in films, and so forth. Um, based on what Mike uh, Kosterlitz and David Thales taught us, I was very dubious. Uh, I did not believe that we should be able to see it and had the opportunity uh, to study unit cell thick films of YBCO, which is about as two-dimensional as you can get. And uh, I hope to convince you that, in fact, there is no costulate salus transition in these samples uh, in agreement with the theory. And that is to say, you don't get the jump. And then I'll give a little bit of summary and, um, you know, if there's some time, talk a little bit about some newer developments. But I think it's probably better not to rush through too many things. So, um, first, in honor of my uh, mentor, Mike Tinkham, I'd like to give the uh, nickel tour of superconductivity for people. Um, it's a beautiful field. It's been a privilege to work on it for so many decades. Uh, but all we need to know here, if you're not an expert on this, is the, uh, a couple of things. The first is, there is a superconducting order parameter, psi of R. I'm going to see if I can get the uh, laser pointer, the f fictitious one, to work uh, here. Uh, oops, I'm sorry, I went ahead. Let's try this again. Uh, and if it doesn't work, I will not try. There it is, psi of r. It has a magnitude and an e to the i phi, like the uh, uh, wave function in quantum mechanics, but the interpretation is different. The uh, magnitude of psi squared isn't a probability now, but it's the superfluid density, the number of Cooper pairs per unit volume. And uh, if we neglect the vector potential, but of course we can put all that back, I just wanted to keep the equation simple, the superfluid uh, current is proportional to the gradient of the phase of the order parameter. Now this is actually an equivalent form for the one that you see in your elementary quantum mechanics book for reasons that I don't understand. Uh, 
It's never written this way, but it's quite a pretty result. And it tells us that when we have supercurrents, or in quantum mechanics, when we have probability currents, uh, they're the result of phase gradients. Um, so let's see in pictures what that tells us. I love representing a superconductor in a picture uh, inspired by my understanding of the costulus salis theory of, of a sort of lattice model. Okay, So I just pick a bunch of points in the superconductor and I can draw a little arrow at, at each point, the length of the arrow, will tell me the magnitude of psi squared, the superfluid density, and the direction that it makes with the x-axis will tell me the phase. Okay, So it's very much analogous to a magnet, but with very different interpretation of what the things mean. So uh, what I've drawn here is a ground state. Um, all of the arrows have the same length. They're all pointing in the same direction. And since there is no phase gradient here, there is no current flowing. Um, so this is a good pictorial way of looking at the ground state of a superconductor. If there's no magnetic field, if everything's uniform, if everything is clean and pretty. Now next I'd like to draw what the current looks like in this picture. Um, you can see here that I've drawn, um, by the way, using MATLAB, showing I'm not that old. We used to have to draw these pictures by hand, but this is much more convenient. But anyway, you can see here that there's a gradient in the, in the x direction, uh, and this corresponds to a current flowing in the x direction. Okay? And uh, no questions about that. I, uh, I haven't seen anyone leave yet, so that's a good sign. Um, Here's a picture of um, something that's very important in superconductors, and as you all know, because you've been there for, for a little while and you're at this conference, very important in the costulus salis transition. Uh, this is a picture of a vortex. The center of the vortex is in the center of the diagram, and if you look at the way the gradients in the phase go, you see that there's a, a circulating current going around that center. So I've shown you a ground state, a couple of different configurations that have currents flowing, and uh, all these things were pretty well understood prior to KT, and uh, a, a good deal, say, in the first edition of Tinkham's book was explained in terms of these kind of uh, pictures. Okay, so let's, let's look at what we did understand. Uh, prior to KT, uh, fluctuations, fluctuations uh, that you could call phase waves or you'd call spin waves in a magnet, uh, below the nominal TC, they destroy the order or the superconductivity in D equals 1 and 2. Now, we have to be careful about what that means. Um, if I put on my amateur theorist hat, it means that the phases are not correlated as we go out to infinite distance. Now, if you're an experimenter, however, and you make a thin film or a wire, even if you do it today with very good lithography, very thin films, very narrow wires, if you get cold enough, you won't measure any uh, resistivity, and you, won't me and you will measure something that looks very much like a supercurrent, that is to say, a current that is present in the absence of dissipation. Uh, but... But if you look carefully, you'll find that that's more about limitations of your measurements than it is about the physical reality. Okay, so I don't think anyone questions the, the first bullet point, and uh, it was uh, also understood prior to KT for other systems. Another thing that happened and was well studied, though, is that above TC, you could get momentary fluctuations. They'd come into being and disappear. Of, of these phase waves, and they had the effect of increasing the conductivity. Little bubbles of superconductivity would occur in one, two, or three dimensions uh, that would cause a decrease in the resistivity, uh, an increase in the conductivity. This was something that was well studied both theoretically and experimentally. Uh, some of the first experiments, uh, and the most beautiful, were by Rolf Glover at Maryland, who um, I had the privilege of collaborating with on some of the work that I'll talk with you about here after I'd moved to Maryland. Uh, now, in, a, in almost a separate field, there was a lot of interest in the technology of superconductors. People wanted to make magnets. Uh, 
And when you have a magnetic field, that means that there are going to be vortices present like this. Now, if these vortices can move, as I'll show you uh, in the next few slides, um, we find that uh, there is an ohmic dissipation that results, which is a, the last thing you want if you're trying to make a superconducting magnet. You want the superconductivity. Uh, so let's see where that dissipation comes from, because it gives us um, insight into what we can measure in superconductors and why our job was uh, a lot better than John Reppy's in neutral uh, uh, helium. Um, in, in looking for this phase transition, okay? So uh, I want to add one more equation here. Uh, I've repeated the static ones here, but there's another one here in the darker type, uh, which is the Josephson equation. It tells us that if I have two points in the superconductor, the voltage between those two points is the Planck constant divided by 2E times the time derivative of the phase difference. So all the pictures I've shown you so far have been static, um, but if the phases evolve in time, we are going to get voltages resulting from that time evolution. Okay, so let's see how that works in the case of a vortex. Um, see here, I've momentarily lost my ability to change slides there, that's better. Now, this looks like a picture of the ground state, but if you look carefully, you can see that the phases on the left are pointing a little to the left of vertical, and the phases on the right are pointing a little to the right of the vertical, and that's because I made this drawing by putting a vortex center um, somewhere down in the floor below you. Um, and what I can do is, uh, and what I did do, is make a movie where that vortex starts to move and uh, goes through the sample, exits at the top, and keeps going until it's very far away. So let's look at what that looks like here, okay? And um, let's see, it didn't start. Let me try that again, excuse me. Uh, there we go. Okay, there's the vortex zipping through, and it goes all the way up to the top and leaves the sample. Now, this state is very similar to the last one. In fact, it's, it's equivalent as far as uh, uh, anything you could measure is concerned. Uh, if, if the vortex is far enough away, there's no current. However, something important happened. Um, this is what it ends up looking like. The phases on the left and right are now pointing downward, whereas before the vortex started moving, they were pointing upward. And what they do is rotate the one on the left uh, clockwise, the one on the right counterclockwise. And let's go do that a couple of times. And what has happened is in the time that it's taken the vortex to move is that the phase difference from left to right has changed by two pi. And by the Josephson equation at the top of the page, that means that there was a voltage pulse that occurred. Okay? So, um, it takes a little bit of effort, but it's not too hard to show that if I put some labels on the sample, a width and a length, uh, and the vortices in the sample are free to move, uh, the resulting voltage will be proportional to the current, It'll be proportional to the length over the width, and it will also be proportional to the density of free vortices. And this is uh, at the heart of our measurements, any experimenter's measurements, of the Kostrelitz-Stalas transition. If we put a current on and detect a voltage, it means that there are free vortices present. If we know the uh, constants, the material properties that I've left out, and the theory properly, it allows us to measure the free vortex density. And we can do that as a function of current, of uh, magnetic field, if we care to put one on, although I'm not going to do that in this talk. We can do it as a function of temperature. So this is our, our uh, angle into this, into this beautiful field. Um, measuring things like you'd measure the value of resistance that you take out of the parts box in your lab. Um, so no correlation functions here, none of these fancy things, just uh, voltages and currents. All right, so since I didn't hear any noise, no one laughed when I said KT or not KT, it was an allusion to Hamlet. No one laughed still, so I will just let that go.
Um, Kosterlitz and Thales, uh, in their original papers, pointed out very clearly that the vortex-vortex interaction has to be proportional to the log of the separation of the vortices, otherwise you won't see the transition. And that's not true in superconductors. Uh, because the superfluid is charged, it generates a magnetic field itself, and that screens the interaction between a vortex-anti-vortex -vortex pair. Um, and beyond that screening distance, the interaction drops off exponentially. So if a pair of vortices separates enough, they no longer see each other. And what that means is there will be free vortices present at all temperatures. This was uh, discussed in their second paper, I believe. It's very clear and absolutely correct what they said. Okay. And here's the formula for this screening length in superconductivity. We call it the two-dimensional uh, penetration depth, but it's a screening length. Again, if we're bigger than this, the, the vortex-anti-vortex pair unbinds, and, and we don't get a phase transition anymore. So uh, people very early on plugged in numbers. They said, all right, suppose there is one electron per atom. Suppose the film is as thin as you can make it. Uh, one atomic layer thick, and just plugging in some rough numbers, you get a number of order of micron, okay? Now, if you make a sample this small, you're not in the thermodynamic limit. Um, you find that there are not enough vortex-anti-vortex -vortex pairs in the sample to see the transition. And uh, again, this was all pointed out very clearly in the original theoretical papers. Um, so, at this point, it would seem that people should give up, and I shouldn't be giving this talk. Um, but uh, happily, uh, both for this talk, this field, and for my own uh, career, um, superconductors are complicated. And if you take a superconducting material and have the electron mean-free path be short, you don't use the electron density anymore as your effective superfluid density. Um, and I don't want to go into all the details, but the effective uh, density, the actual, I should say, the actual density of Cooper pairs is much, much less than the uh, density of electrons above Tc. Uh, this is the so-called dirty limit. And this is the path that uh, quite a few people exploited. It's tricky. Uh, but if you make a dirty superconductor, one that has a short mean-free path, and if you make it uniform, um, then you can actually observe the kosterlitz thales transition. It's possible to get this 2D penetration depth up to the size of, uh, of centimeters. And that's uh, what, for example, uh, Art Hebbard and uh, Alan Goldman did in their uh, uh, really important path-breaking work in the field. It's the only thing that's going to work, though. Now, um, for those of you who knew Mike Tinkham, um, he was... Uh, a genius, and he was very clever, and he was able to do physics in a way that the rest of us can't, with uh, minimal infrastructure. So at the time I was um, working at Harvard as a postdoc, uh, there was one evaporator, and we could make complicated metals like copper and tin and lead. We couldn't make very thin films as uh, Alan did and does, and we couldn't make uh, the interesting um, uh, um, um, combination of indium, indium oxide uh, that Art could make at Bell Labs. So we had to think of a bit different way. And uh, again, we weren't the first to think about this, but um, there, there's another way to make a weak superconductor to get an effective, very low supercurrent density. So I've drawn a picture here of a, a superconductor, which as everyone knows, is, is they're blue. Uh, and uh, it has a superfluid density that uh, nature gives us. It depends on the material and it depends on the mean free path and things like that. Uh, but if I put a weak link in there, and I've drawn uh, that in red, if I put in a an insulator on the nanometer scale, or a normal metal, which can even be of the size of micrometers or more, what it does is effectively weakens the coupling between the right side and the left side. So by doing this, we've made an artificial material that has effectively a very low superfluid density. Uh, it's a thing called a Josephson junction array because that's what this is, especially, I guess, if you're a traditionalist, if this is an insulator. But we experimentalists 
call all weak links Joseph's injunctions. So we're hitting the Nobel Prize winners all over the place here. Um, so what uh, we did, um, what David Abraham did uh, with the help of uh, Tune Klopfeich, who was a postdoc at the time, and myself, was uh, make samples that were a big square array of such uh, devices. So here's a schematic from David Abraham's thesis. Um, there are little square islands of superconductor that are of the order of micrometers with a normal metal in between. Now, I just said that we didn't have the equipment to make such things because we didn't have lithography. Uh, and you're going to hear some more about what we didn't have, but I'll tell you in a second how we did it. It uh, turns out that this screening size goes like the one over the uh, maximum supercurrent that can be carried from one island to the next, the critical current, and that can easily be of the order of a centimeter. Now, we made these by evaporating through a metal mesh. It was an actual mechanical mask, uh, and it's, it's quite remarkable that it worked. But we were able to make uh, quite big integrated circuits of this artificial material. I think nowadays people call them metamaterials, which is a much better name. Uh, but I've drawn here, by the way, what a vortex would look like in such a sample, although unfortunately we can't see the phases. So here are some pictures from David's thesis, which gives you another idea of how long ago this was. Uh, on the left is a uh, uh, low magnification picture, and these little squares are squares of lead that are evaporated first through this metal mesh, and, uh, and then a layer of copper is quickly evaporated on top of it before anything has a chance to oxidize very much. You can tell old timer uh, uh, plots because if you look carefully, you can see that David Abraham, who had a fine hand, made this label by hand. Uh, laid it on top of the picture and then took another picture of it. That's what we used to do. Uh, on the right, uh, there's a picture here uh, which is one of these optical illusions. It looks like these are holes, but they're actually things that are sticking up, little bits of lead underneath the copper coating. And you can see that the size of these things is about six micrometers. It's quite remarkable mesh that we were able to get to evaporate through. And if there's time at the end, I'll show you the apparatus that we use this for. No one has to do this anymore, and uh, that's a good thing. All right, anyway, um, here's Kosterlitz thallus in pictures. Um, when T is less than the Kosterlitz thallus temperature, and when there is no current present, there are a lot of vortex-anti-vortex -vortex pairs uh, this was the best I could do drawing them until I got tired of uh, drawing them at different sizes. But they come in all sizes. There's a clockwise and a counterclockwise vortex. Its motion is strongly correlated with a nearby one or with one that's far away. They exist at all length scales, and the theorists have provided us an understanding of what that distribution is like. Okay? Now, what happens as I uh, lower the temperature... I'm sorry, as I raise the temperature, well, not much, except that you can see that the vortex-anti-vortex -vortex pair that was farthest separated it now unbinds due to thermal fluctuations. So here is low temperature, and here's just a tiny bit higher temperature. Uh, that's harder to do in the lab than it is in PowerPoint, but uh, it's something that we know how to do, that we learned how to do. So there is now a free vortex density where there wasn't one, okay? This would be easy because if, if things were simple, but of course they never are, um, at least not in experiments. Um, because uh, you might recall, and I'll write the equation again, that the resistivity is proportional to the free vortex density. So at low temperatures, there's no resistivity. At higher temperatures, the resistivity appears. But there's another case we have to consider. I want to go just a little below TKT again and apply a current. And what happens is that that current exerts a force, uh, a kind of, not a kind of, a magnus force uh, upon the vortices, causes them to, uh, the farthest separated ones, to unbind again. So this is a problem. Uh, Remember, we measure the temperature, but we don't know a priori where the transition temperature should be. We can regulate temperatures to a few millikelvin uh, and do very careful experiments, 
But experimentally, how do we tell the difference between that, where it's unbound by thermal fluctuations, and that, where it's unbound by currents? And this was something that bedeviled the early experimental stages of this, of this field. Um, so let me tell you a little bit how we sorted this out. But again, let me remind you of the uh, equation that is so useful to us uh, who do experiments, to we who do experiments. For T greater than TKT, uh, in the original papers, Kosterwitz and Thales showed what the free vortex density is in the limit of very low current. Now, I'm putting that I there, but right now, just imagine that's a zero. And it has this interesting uh, exponential of uh, 1 over T minus TKT to the one-half. It goes to zero as T approaches TKT, okay? Uh, and the voltage is proportional to the free vortex density. It's going to have an I. It's going to have an R0 that's of order the normal state resistance. And it's going to have a constant of order unity here, um, which is uh, what we hope to measure, okay? So at first sight, this looks great. Uh, and we can do a similar thing for just below TKT. Uh, here there are no free vortices unless we apply a current, but the generation of them, as shown in the work of a number of people, I particularly like Nelson and Halperin's paper on this, is a power in I, some A of T minus 1, because we want to reserve the A of T for the voltage, the voltage introduces another power of I, and the prediction was that V goes as C I to the A of T, where A of T is greater than or equal to 3. So we get power law dependence like that, below the costerless salus temperature, and ohmic dependence like that, above the costerless salus temperature. But, in addition to thermal fluctuations, currents also unbind vortices, and we have to consider those so I'm going to strip away some of the formulas and write down the whole mess, okay? What, what we have to understand in order to do experiments properly. So let me, again, take a minute to go through this. And uh, if I go through it too slowly or too quickly, wave your hands frantically because uh, uh, I always hate when I get lost in talks. Anyway, this is the prediction above TKT for small current and below TKT, ohmic power law. The problem is that in medium, intermediate currents, you get power law uh, voltage current characteristics again, even at higher temperatures. It crosses over from ohmic to this behavior, with the power being less than three. And it can be pretty tricky to, to, you, to know where you're, uh, where you're at, but it's also not proper to just say, okay, wherever it's three, that's my transition, because remember, we're supposed to be testing the theory. At very high currents, it crosses back over to being ohmic. Okay, so our work is a little cut out for us here. So how do we go about convincing ourselves that this is all real? Well, let me first show a, gra show a graph here. Uh, this is at a 10 microamp current in a sample that was made in 1981. <clears throat> Excuse me, the voltage versus temperature. Um, I won't go into this, but it's a clever little model that Mike Tinka made up that amounts to a kind of mean field theory. Here is the transition temperature of lead. The islands become superconducting. As you lower the temperature, the coupling between the islands becomes stronger, and then it drops off rapidly to zero. And I can tell you that it's a pretty good fit to this formula. Um, but, excuse me a moment. There are problems with it. Uh, first of all, with more careful analysis, in this system, the R0 is not a constant. It's temperature dependent. If you wish, it's from this background, an extension of it. And B here is also temperature dependent. And if you just do a naive fit to this data, assuming that both of these numbers are constant, it'll work. There are you know, a bunch of adjustable parameters, at least three or four. Uh, R0, B, and TKT, so it's 3. But you'll often find that B is not of order 1, and that, that's a warning sign. Something is going wrong here. So um, what we realized is that uh, 
we needed to look for a, a, a smoking gun. We needed a real signature for this transition. And it's, it's, it's hidden in all these things here. At a low enough I, V should be proportional to I, below TKT, and it should be a power law where the power is greater than three. That's what we need to look for. We need to turn our current down far enough to where we either see this or we run out of resolution and don't see it, okay? There is a jump in A of T from one to three, and this is a, a consequence of the universal jump in the superfluid density predicted by theory. A of T depends on the superfluid density, the effective renormalized superfluid density uh, in two dimensions, okay? So um, this looks obvious in hindsight, uh, but I will tell you personally, uh, I was a little slow in realizing this. We analyzed the data and looked at it for a long time, uh, we were troubled about the fact that we seem to be able to fit anything. Uh, and at some point, uh, this, this occurred to me as being the way to go. Um, so anyway, here is uh, what data used to look like. Now, this isn't the actual raw data, but uh, for those of you who are experimenters, you young people, uh, uh, I know people who talk about the good old days. They weren't. Okay, it was We took data on mechanical machines called XY recorders. They cost thousands of dollars and had precision motors in them that would move a pen around across a piece of paper and would trace things like current versus voltage while you s sat there and adjusted things by hand yourself for hours and hours, usually at night because that's when everything is quieter. Okay, That isn't what this data is. This is data that uh, David Abraham and I extracted from those IV, uh, I'm sorry, XY recorder plots and plot it again. Uh, part of our toolkit was having, uh, thanks to Koifel and Esser, um, uh, paper that would have, say, log, log here. This is four decades versus three, I believe. It goes from one uh, nanoamp to one microamp on one axis here. I think it's, no, I'm sorry, it's a, it's, a, it's a milliamp to a microamp. This goes down to 10 nanovolts up to 10 microvolts, so that's a factor of three decades. This is not a complete data set. It's the only one I could find. And we would just plot these points, as many of them as we could stand taking off of the original data. And then we would go through uh, with a ruler, because in fact we didn't have personal computers, and do the best we could fitting by hand to extract the behavior. Uh, does this bring back happy uh, memories, Art and, uh, and Alan? I, I hope not, because if it does, you're, you're both losing your minds. It was awful. It's, it's amazing that any experimental physicist ever had a social life, because this is how we would spend our time. Uh, anyway, um, then we would give this thing uh, to a draftsman who would make it into a nice picture that we could put in the papers. Okay. It all looked very nice, it wasn't, it was very hard. Taking that data and concentrating on voltage sensitivity around 10 nanovolts, okay? Uh, pulling the slopes off by hand, we got this A of T at low temperatures down a little above a degree. It dropped smoothly and then in a rounded way, uh, crossed over to one. Um, a number of people analyzed this degree of uh, rounding. Alan Goldman with a, uh, a postdoc, Alan Caden, a friend of mine and a lab mate of mine when I was a student, uh, wrote a beautiful paper about uh, this. And it, and it fits their uh, development of, of how much it should be rounded out by the current that we still had to apply. We can't make measurements at zero current. Um, and... Um, Remember, the prediction is that at high currents, we shouldn't see this rounded out jump, and indeed we didn't. If we change the degree of sensitivity to 100 nanovolts, it pretty much just varied smoothly. Um, there were a lot of curves that had the open circles published prior to our work. Uh, I, I think we were one of the first, though, to actually get the jump, and that's where the title of the paper comes from, of this talk, I should say. Um, all right, uh, let's go on a little bit. I just want to write down some of these papers um, uh, because I'm, I'm very proud of them and I was very privileged to be able to do this when I was young. Uh, the first is uh, uh, the experimental paper from which that data came. The second is a paper that I wrote because I uh, sat down and decided I really needed to understand uh, 
um, the, the theory which had been worked out by other people for continuous superconductors for helium and and just put it all together for an array of weak links uh, and it ended up looking nice enough that we decided to publish it. Um, and also a review article that's um, hundreds of pages long um, from 2000 that um, summed up what as best we could what was known at that point. There are other reviews uh, by Jorge Jose and things that are um, um, cover the theory much better than we could, but we had a sort of experimental emphasis on this. If anyone would like a copy of the last paper, it's not available officially electronically, but uh, drop me an email and I'll send you a copy. It will probably get me in trouble with the publishers, but you know what can they do? I have tenure. Uh, they can't fire me. All right, so there is um, something about arrays. Uh, I didn't try to make this into a review article, uh, but I, I, uh, I want to go on now to the other uh, set of data, which I was able to do at Maryland um, because um, of the extraordinary people, in particular Venki Venkatesan, who's now in Singapore at, uh, across town from you. Um, we were able to make unit cell thick films of yttrium barium copper oxide, okay, because Vanke and his, his uh, crew really know how to fabricate materials. And there were many claims for films like this, for thicker films, of seeing the Kostrelis-Dallas transition, and I was uh, dubious. But let's, let's look at some of this data and see how things progressed in uh, 15 years or so. Each of these data points here... Uh, is taken by uh, regulating the temperature of the cryostat, putting on a fixed current, letting everything settle down, and then taking uh, lots of voltages until it, uh, the uh, I'm sorry until the uncertainty was below the level we wanted, and then reversing the current at the same temperature and doing the same thing, uh, just in case there were any DC uh, voltage offsets. And here at 40 Kelvin, we have ohmic response. Now, if you just look at this uh, 2D film. Uh, you see that the ohmic response persists to low temperatures, but as you get to lower and lower temperatures, the voltage on a log scale here, that's 10 decades, or I'm sorry, six decades or so, versus the current, it's dropping like a rock, okay? It's very tempting to look at this and say that is superconductivity, but we've got to be careful because this is a clean superconductor, and I can estimate using the known parameters for YBCO, and by the way, from the data in a later analysis, uh, uh, M star is roughly twice the electron mass. The uh, um, density, superfluid density is well known. It's one unit cell thick, and we get about 50 microns. 50 micrometers is not in the thermodynamic limit. So we have to ask ourselves, what is it we are actually seeing here? Is this really a phase transition or not? All right, so let's, uh, let's look at it, uh, and it won't be too much long here. And remember that what's happening here, we're looking for a jump. V goes as the first power of I above TKT, and it goes like a power in, uh, where the, the, I'm sorry, where the power is greater than three below. But we have such good data now, we can take the log of both sides of this equation, uh, as we did in the graph, and then take its derivative numerically. D log V D log I will be A of T, okay? So we should be able to read off this A of T and see if there's actually a jump. And let's look at what happens when we did that. It looks like this, okay? Um, at, let's start at high temperature, okay, here. And uh, uh, about 50 Kelvin, you see it's ohmic, whatever the current is. We're above the, tra the nominal transition temperature. As we lower the temperature, we get an interesting kind of behavior. This will eventually go down to a power of one, uh, but it's kind of tough on the sample and burns them out if you do it too much. But it goes up and then comes back down again to one. Here's the nominal Kostrelitz-Salis transition temperature where the slope is three. And if all I had done is what we'd done in the old days and uh, read the data, uh, uh, put the data on a log-log plot and put a ruler through it, we may well have concluded that there was a phase transition here or perhaps at some higher, uh, lower temperature and higher power. And there were claims made for seeing that. But you can see here, even uh, four degrees colder, it goes up the slope on the log-log plot and comes back down again and approaches one. 
Now, eventually, we run out of sensitivity. We just don't have enough uh, uh, sensitivity in our voltmeter to see this come back down. But all of them are showing signs of going up and coming back down. So if there is a phase transition here, it is not a costulous salus transition, but that's fine. There isn't supposed to be, okay? What this is is a kind of broad crossover from ohmic behavior to a fluctuation do dominated regime where the resistivity becomes very, very small, but never strictly goes to zero. Okay, so in these unit cell thick films of YBCO, to say it again, there is no KT transition. There's no long range order at all, this is what we expect. Uh, the resistance is small but non zero at all points where I can measure it. And uh, here's the paper where we reported this. Well, I can see that I've used up my time, uh, so I'm going to just put the uh, summary up here and uh, uh, and uh, ask if people have any questions that they'd like to ask. And I, I'm very uh, grateful that you were willing to tolerate a long-distance uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. So are there any questions here? Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think you can see me. I'm not on the camera, but uh, I'll, I'll move. Uh, I'll move. Uh, I'll move in front of the okay, camera. Okay, but I can't, so I can't you... hear you. And, I, I'm, and uh, what is your question? Uh, so the question is the following: There is recent data by Lamberger and company on a single cell YBCO, where they see very clearly on the penetration depth the KT transition. Actually, there are two KT transition because it's a bilayer, so there is the symmetric and the anti-symmetric uh, degree of freedom. So how do you reconcile this with the, uh, with the transport data that you... Okay, that is, a, that, that is an excellent question, and uh, Tom Lemberger uh, is a better physicist than I am, I freely admit this, and is an old friend. I don't know. Uh, I've been working on quantum computing, uh, a different type of thing where phases matter, but I will certainly uh, look that paper up. Uh, again, it's, it's, uh, it's very tricky. Uh, these uh, mutual inductance techniques have the same problems that the current voltage techniques have. Uh, he is very careful, but I would uh, be willing to bet a nickel that I'm careful. So the, now I'm not saying that he's wrong. I, I think that you will see uh, things that there is vortex unbinding that goes on, all right? Uh, uh, at higher temperatures, they're mostly unbound. At lower temperatures, they're mostly bound. And I really do believe you could see the evidence for the single layer and double layer things, all the things that you're saying. What I would say, though, being, a, a you know, as an old professor, a hopeless pedant, I don't believe, I would be stunned if there were actually a true phase transition in those samples, okay? Uh, but I'll get in touch with Tom, and you know we've locked horns on this issue and others before. It's always instructive and pleasant. Okay, um, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Any other question? Oh, there must be questions. I see young people in the audience. Um, yes, there are young people in the audience. <laughs> yes, and by the way, if you ask a hard enough question, I I might uh, you know become ill as a consequence, have a heart attack, and you have opened up a job. So please <laughs> ask the question. <laughs> Very good. Is there any other question? If not, uh, yes, Art. Yeah, uh, Chris, is it possible to add a magnetic field or add additional dirt to the sample and, and see a transition to an insulating state? In the um, people have done this, not in these kind of samples. Uh, we're not, we're not uh, you, you can tell from the structure. First of all, our losses are very high, okay? They're, they're not, but make it out of tunnel junctions. And uh, a, a lot of fascinating physics comes up, um, similar to the things that people have done in continuous films. Uh, but with the added catch that the vortex uh, mass can be quite a bit uh, um, higher, I believe. And I will admit that that uh, field, which I have tried to follow, uh, I think there's room for work to be done there. Um, and uh, uh, lots of fascinating physics to be seen beyond what has already been seen. Hans Moe's group did a lot of work on this in the old days, uh, and I'm, I'm aware of other work, uh, which is not at the tip of my tongue. Uh, 